So um, I tell my mom's story like 300 times a year. I travel, I speak, I fly all over the place. What I don't do is like history lessons for ahead of time, so you'll have to bear with me on this particular session because that's kind of where I'm at. But uh, anyway, I wanted to see, does anybody here have any family members, great grandparents, grandparents, great uncles that were actually in World War II? Yeah, what, what was that about? Uh, my grandpa was pressed into the German army. Wow, that's something. So he, he's from Germany then, your family is okay. Very cool, yes? Do you know what he was doing? No. no. It's so interesting that generation was pretty private about talking about their stuff. So, who else? I saw some more hands. Yes. Well, my great grandfather was just Not sure what he did, but he was actually killed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. Was there more hands? Yes. My grandpa was at uh, Pearl Harbor. Wow. I forget, I forget what ship it was, but he, his ship sank, but he survived. He did. Yeah. yeah. We're up to the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, aren't we? Pretty close? Yeah. Yeah. That's something else. And I, there was some more hands. Anybody else that had family members, World War II? No. Nope, nope, nope. No. All right. Rick said that he had you guys watch Schindler's List a couple of days ago. Can you kind of give me maybe what your takeaway from that was? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts or your ideas. Disturbing. Disturbing. In what way? Yes, very disturbing. Had anybody seen the movie before? No. You had. Yeah. I have about such a such a long time ago. So. It was almost 100 years ago when all this happened. Um, it's a long, long time ago. But I want to give you kind of an, um, what I learned about World War II, which again, was not a history student. And the first thing I thought of is World War, was it really a world war? I mean, or I, I could remember like Germany and England and Japan and stuff. <coughs> Actually, all the countries except for 14 in the world were involved in some capacity. Wow. And nine were actually countries, five were like microstates, like the Vatican City and stuff. So it truly, truly was a world war. We're going to focus and narrow in a little bit on Germany because they're the ones that actually started World War II. And it kind of was a layover from World War I, which I know very, very little about. But World War II ended in a financial disaster for Germany. I mean, it was devastated. And on top of that, the German people were humiliated because basically World War I was <coughs> blamed on them. And there was this Treaty of Versailles, I don't know if I'm saying that right, where they were forced not only to have all the blame for World War II, but forced to pay back all the money that it cost, which in today's dollars would be like $270 billion. It was a ton. Um, and it was after that that Hitler came on the scene. He was part of the German Workers Union, but he had aspirations for more and was really interested in the Nazi party. Now, before World War I, it was actually um, a republic and or a mon monarchy, uh, Germany, but then became a republic. And then it was kind of nothing for a while. He decided to get involved into the Nazi party and he actually ran for president, which I didn't know. He didn't win, he came in second. But the person who did become president uh, appointed him as chancellor of Germany and then that president died a year later and so Hitler became Fuhrer. And he had some really interesting ideas because again, I just didn't know anything about that. In his mind, he wanted Germany to become a world power and he believed with all his heart that the Germans were superior in race, in mentality, in everything, over everybody. 
But on the very bottom of his list, there was a couple of, of groups of people that he felt like um, soiled their race. And the first and the highest one was the Jewish population. He absolutely detested them. He felt like they needed to be gone. And there was other people too, the Slavic people, like Polish people, which would have included me, um, and gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, blacks, homosexuals. Uh, he had this need to rid the world of them. And at the same time, he wanted Germany to keep growing and growing. And to be able to do that, he needed more land. He needed land to have the German people be able to spread out, have families, and multiply. And so he kind of had a plan. He needed land, so maybe he would start with a neighboring country, which was Poland in this particular case. And there was something interesting about Poland. Back in the 13th and 14th century, Poland was kind of this newly formed country. And the president or the czar or whoever Poland had as their leader was pretty clever. He looked around and he saw that that new formed country had a lot of farmers and families, but not a lot of educated people. And, and to make that country stronger and wealthier and, and be able to really compete in the world, he saw the Jewish community throughout Europe. In Europe back then, in fact, from the beginning of time, it seemed like the Jews have had a lot of struggles. And in most countries, they were not allowed to own property. They were not alone, allowed to, to be in business and things. And so they became money lenders and entrepreneurs. And they became wealthy. They were really big in education. So they took their kids and they educated them. And so this president of Poland <coughs> saw the potential in the Jewish community. He opened the doors of Poland for the Jews to come in. And they came in in droves. In fact, Poland had the largest Jewish population of any, uh, anybody in Europe. And they thrived in there. And they were provided safety. They were provided lands and stuff. And so Hitler looks. He wants to have space. He wants to get rid of the Jews. Poland is a good spot to do that. So let me look and see whatever I have in here. <laughs> so how would you get? So he wants to take Poland. He wants to get in. He wants to get rid of the Jews. But he's got a problem. His people in Germany, how does he get them to go along with what he wants to do? How would you do that? Absolutely, <laughs> propaganda. It was interesting. Um, my mom's show was a Broadway play back in 2008 and 2009, and we were able to go into Washington, D.C., to the Holocaust Museum. And they have one section of this huge, incredible museum that's just called propaganda. And you walk through there, and it blows your mind. They actually had games for little kids kind of like Monopoly, where you kind of count the dice and you land on a spot. And if you're lucky, you land on one where you can collect a Jew and put it in jail. Unbelievable. They had tons of different things like that. Posters where they would paint ridiculous, distorted pictures of Jewish people and, and tell stories about how Jews drank the blood of the children of whatever country they were in and stuff. So the propaganda was huge. But there was another reason why a lot of people went along with that. So let's think. You've got a group of people, the Jewish people, who are very highly intelligent. They're able to have these jobs. I mean, when you look in history, the Jewish people are the physicians and the scientists and the musicians, the bankers. So because they value education, they're all over. So how do you get the general public to kind of go along with maybe exterminating all of them? What would be the motivation you could use? You're just regular family. Maybe you have a small little farm. You're just making things, you know, getting by day by day. That's right. They're taking their opportunities. Just sheer jealousy. It's like they got it all. 
and it, they're not even us, they're not even, even part of us, but they got the big houses, they've got, we have to go to them for money lending and stuff, so jealousy. And if you get rid of these people, what happens to their houses and their possessions and stuff? Yeah, they're up for grabs. So it's really, really interesting how that happens. Yep. Uh. <coughs> and so there was tons of persecution even before Hitler started World War II. And the Jews felt that. So why do you think they didn't leave? Because at first, that's what he tried to do. He tried to get them to leave. But put yourself in their position. Why would you not leave a country that you've lived in for generations, a country that you built a life in? Any ideas? Pardon me? Exactly, everything you have and know is there. Plus, I don't think that they believe that anything as traumatic as what happened would happen. After all, in World War II, the Jewish people believed that they were Germans first, and they fought in the war, and they died in the war, so it was their country. And they totally didn't feel like any of that was going to happen at all. So, <coughs> all right, let's see what else we come up with. You got any ideas, Rick? Help. <laughs> it's interesting, I found a, um, a quote about what the Holocaust was, because that's the, this is what we're gonna be talking about. The Holocaust was a systematic uh, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. So it was intentional. And that's what makes World War II, at least this particular part of it, different from any other war in history. Most wars are done financially or I mean, we have in our lifetime over oil, over disputes and things like this. The Holocaust was an intentional design to totally eradicate a whole race of people off the face of the earth. This was a war to completely change and wipe out a group of people. Pretty crazy. So I'm gonna, in the next session, tell you my mom's story. But you guys are like the perfect group for me to do that because when she was born in 1922, Poland had just been a free country again. It had been occupied by different countries all the time, so she grew up in freedom. But as a teenager, she was hearing all the stuff that was going on, all the rumors she was seeing of subtle changes and things. But she was your age when Hitler invaded Poland, 17, 18 years old. She had just graduated high school, just gone away to college, left her family. So it's a story that could happen to us today in different ways. And it's a story of the choices that we can make, the tiny bits of things that are poured into us as young people in our families, in our homes, in our schools, and the opportunity to be able to use what we've learned or to be able to find out who we are, what we're made out of. Do you have anything else to add, Rick? Yes, and I honestly, they did make a pact with Hitler to invade Poland um, uh, on both ends. I'm not exactly sure why, and I did try to look at that. Do you have some thoughts on that? It was a deal Hitler made to be able to do it without the Russians really, like they were attacking. He had a plan to get them eventually. But yes, because he turned around and tried to get them, yeah. And I do share that in the story that when Hitler invaded, then 16 days later, Russia and the Russia has invaded too. So poor Poland had it had a problem. Any other thoughts? Why don't you just why don't you just start your mom's story? Okay, okay. So if my mom was here today, instead of me, you'd see this woman 
quiz about this tall. She was just tiny. She had white, <laughs> white, fluffy hair and big blue eyes and an accent like somebody you've probably never heard of. Her name was Jaja Gabor. But my mom would sound like this. Good morning, my darling children. I am so happy to be here with you today, seeing all your beautiful faces, and I want you to know that I've come here today because I love you. And she'd mean that with her whole heart. And uh, every time I tell her story, I just pray that that love could be felt because we could all need a whole lot more of it. So like I said, mom was born in Poland. The few years that it was a free country, she was the oldest of five beautiful sisters, she used to say. Her father was an architect. Her mom was a homemaker. And when mom graduated high school, her dream was to become a nurse. She wanted at one point to be a nun, but she was really a stinker and her parents were like, yeah, not really for you. So <laughs> they were raised Catholic. So anyway, um, she graduated high school. Her parents sent her off to nursing school. It was a ways a distance from where she lived and she'd really never been away from home by herself before. So it was exciting and nerve wracking, probably like how you guys felt maybe about coming out here a totally new thing that you really didn't know what you were expecting. So she's in school for a couple of months and she gets up one morning kind of early to do a little studying before class. It was September 1st, 1939. She walks out of the dorm to go to the cafeteria and it was the start of a sunny day. But she said the sun outside had totally disappeared because there was airplanes flying all over, dropping bombs everywhere. Without any warning, Hitler had picked that day to invade Poland. All communication was totally cut off at that point. And mom, she said she just stood there in shock until someone actually came up, grabbed her, threw her down on the ground and said, you're gonna get yourself killed standing up. There was no way for her to call home to find out if her parents were okay and her sisters. They couldn't find out about her. Bombs completely changed the whole landscape around her. She said moment by moment things were changing. They turned her school into a makeshift hospital where they tried their best to take care of people that were wounded, but it was overwhelming. People came in and they had limited supplies. They lost their well, they lost water. They didn't have any way to keep things you know, clean, but they did what they could. The night she said she would hide under a stairwell because the bomb has continued and you never knew what was going to collapse around you. One afternoon, Mom said there was this group of people who came by. They called themselves the Polish Underground. And they were looking for people to join up and fight the enemies because six days after Hitler invaded, Stalin from Russia also invaded Poland on the other end and her country was <laughs> gone in a second. Some of the teachers joined up and my mom decided that she'd join up with this group. They had to go out into the woods to live. They dug holes in the forest floor to, to sleep in and covered themselves with tarps. But it was an absolute nightmarish time because they were starving, they were cold, they had disbanded, they really had no power and, and desperation sucked in. And every morning mom would wake up to find people who had taken their lives in the middle of the night without any hope. And her job was to help clean the bodies and bury them. It was a hellish time. She said winter kept setting in more and more. It got colder and colder. Their supplies were almost gone. And at one point they found themselves kind of close to a nearby town and a small group decided that they would walk to town to get some more things. And mom was the youngest person in this whole group, but they had her come along too. She said they had to like walk through the forest floor until they got to the road that would lead to this town. And when they got to the road, the older people in the group said, Irene, that was my mom's name, I should have probably told you, Irene or Irena. Irene, you stay back and mark the trail. We'll go get what we need and come back. So she stood there all by herself she said that she could smell a bakery at the edge of this town, smell like hot, fresh cinnamon rolls, and you know how good that smells when you're starving. 
She said everything in her being was just longing for that, and she just stood there taking in this aroma, concentrated so hard on that that she didn't see or hear a truck full of Soviet soldiers coming her way. But those soldiers saw her. They jumped out of the truck and they chased her. She ran as fast as she could, but they caught her and beat her, ripped her clothes off, gang raped her, and then left her for dead in the snow. I don't know how long she laid there, but eventually another truck full of Soviet soldiers came by and they saw her body lying there. They stopped, picked her up, threw her in the back of the truck, and dropped her off at a Russian hospital. She was there in that hospital for a long time because her injuries were so severe. She was told she'd never be able to have children. Her insides were ripped so badly. It took a long time for her to get better, but finally when she did, she found out she wasn't free to leave like hospitals today because of her involvement with the Polish underground. She became a forced laborer and she had to work there. It was a totally unsafe place for her to be. And after several months, she found a way to escape, jumped out of a little window, fit through a little crack in the fence, and ran as fast as she could. She didn't know even where she was, but she hoped maybe a town or two away, she had an aunt that lived somewhere in that vicinity, and so this time, very carefully, she made her way through the streets. But she said she came to a part of the town one evening that she said was just weird. She said streets, totally empty. There was doors to buildings that were left wide open, windows that were broken, not one person in sight. It was late and she was tired, so she found an apartment building, went upstairs and fell asleep on a second story floor. But in the morning she woke to screaming and shouting down in the street, so she went to the window and she looked down. And she saw a sight no one was meant to see. If you look in the history books, you'll see something called a death march. But what mom saw was a mass of people being herded down the street like they were cattle. They were all Jews. She could tell because back then, every Jew had to wear an identifying mark. In this case, it was a band on their arm with the Star of David on it. And mom said, looking at this group of people, it would be like if the police came to your neighborhood, busted into every single house and took everyone out. There was a cross section of people from elderly to newborns, families of all ages and sizes. As she was looking out the window, trying to figure out what was going on, she said she saw a young woman who was holding a tiny child as she walked. <laughs> And for no apparent reason, a German soldier came up to her, started yelling at her. The woman didn't understand what he was saying. Mom knew enough German to know he was saying she wasn't walking fast enough. And frustrated, he grabbed that baby from her, threw it in the air, and shot it like it was a bird, just like that. The group continued to be forced to walk down the street, and Mom snuck downstairs and followed at a distance. She followed them as they walked through the town and ended up at the end of town where there was a large field. Someone had dug a big hole in that field. The Jews were forced to stand around the edge of that pit. Mom found a fence nearby and she st stood behind it and watched. She watched as the Jews stood around the edge. She watched as the parents covered their children's eyes with their hands, and she watched as they were shot and dropped into the pit and quickly buried. Now, as I said, my mom was raised Catholic, and she had a really simple childlike faith. She truly believed in God, but she said at that moment, she said, I raised my eyes to the heavens and I screamed out, my God, where are you? How can you let something like this happen? I don't understand. She was so upset, she screamed, I don't even believe you're there. But as she kept walking, she said there was one thought that settled into her heart, into her soul, and it was this. God gives us free will to be good or bad, to help and heal, 
or to hurt and harm, and it's up to us to decide what we'll do. And she said it was right then and there that she made a promise, a vow, <coughs> that if there was ever anything she could do to help, she would. She kept walking, and she finally found the right town that she was sure where her aunt lived. Now, the Germans had quickly changed all Polish writing, all Polish signs, and so it was confusing. She kind of recognized the places, but signs were all different. But finally, she was able to find the right street, the right house where she knew her aunt lived. And just as she was coming up to the front door, the front door opened, and out came mom's four sisters. Her whole family had gone there looking for her. And she had a really wonderful reunion with them. But it was very short-lived because the Germans came and they took her father away. He was an architect and they wanted him to build factories for the German war front. And in war, you do what you're told or you're killed, period. So my grandfather and grandmother, they went, and the, the three younger sisters, they went off to be with him. But they didn't want to take my mom or the next oldest sister because where they were going, was next to a facility that trained German soldiers, and they didn't want the two teenage girls being close to that. So mom and her sister and aunt stayed, and they went to church one Sunday shortly after that, and when they were in the church service, the doors of the church burst open, and in come the German army, yelling at everyone to get up and go outside. They were pulled by their hair, they were kicked, Mom grabbed her sister and her aunt and ran outside trying to get away, but as soon as they walked out, they were separated by age. If you were very old, you were put aside, and very young, you were put aside. But everybody who could work, which would be absolutely everyone in this room, you were put on trucks. Mom was put on a truck separated from her sister and her aunt, with people she didn't know, and taken far away to a town called Tarnopol where she was forced to work in a munitions factory, making ammunition for the German war front. The conditions were horrible. It's freezing cold, barely enough to eat. Mom was so anemic. And one day, a high-ranking German officer, a major, he, kept, he came by the factory to make sure production was being kept up. And when he walked in front of my mom's section, she ended up fainting right at his feet. When she woke up, she was in the office with this man who was staring at her. And she was afraid that if he thought she couldn't keep up, he'd send her further away, just have her killed. And so she pleaded with him, please, sir, I, I haven't been well, but I'm strong and I can do this job if you just give me one more chance, please. <coughs> this 60-year-old German major looked at this teenage, blonde, blue-eyed girl whose last name was Gut, sounds German. Mom could speak German. She was speaking to him in German. And he asked her, are you a German girl? She could have taken that opportunity because Germans wouldn't have had to be doing what she was doing, but she was honest. She said, no, I'm Polish. He said, I like that you're honest, but it's apparent you can't keep up here. You'll come with me. I'll give you another job. So he took her to the camp that he was in charge of. It wasn't a concentration camp. It was a camp that housed German officers, soldiers, secretaries. And mom's job would be serving meals in the diner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And she was given one other job. And that was to oversee the laundry room. She was told that the people in there were not doing a good job at all. And it was her job to get the efficiency going. When she went into the laundry room, she met the 12 Jewish people who were forced to work in there. One was a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a nurse, married couples. These were all people, educated people, stuck in a laundry room and doing tailoring. They were starving. They were scared. Mom did her best to try and help them to learn how to do the tailoring and things. But more than that, she was able, when she was serving meals in the diner, to sneak food to them. In fact, enough food that they could distribute amongst the ghetto where they lived. But even more important than that, she realized when she was serving meals in the diner and the Nazis were there, or the SS or the Gestapo, she could overhear conversations. I mean, she was just a girl. They didn't bother to hide what they were saying around the table when mom was there. But she could learn devastating information that she could pass on to her friends in the laundry room. 
they could spread that information through the ghetto. And because of that, hundreds of people were able to leave areas before they were raided, because that's what the Germans did. They would come into an area, bust into your house, and take you away. One night, Mom was serving meals in the diner, and the Major had at his table one of the heads of the Nazi party. And when she went to go serve him, this Nazi told the Major, next week, don't plan on having any of your Jew workers here. The, the Major's arguing with him, what are you talking about? I've got quotas to fill. How am I going to get them done without my workers? And the Nazi said, I don't care. You hire Poles, hire gypsies. I have my orders that by this time next week there won't be one Jew left alive. And mom realized that that meant the 12 people in the laundry room as well. And she had a difficult decision to, should she tell them that in one week everything they had, including their life, would be gone? But finally she decided I had to tell them and when she did, they pleaded with her, Irene, help us, hide us, do something. She said, I, I've got a tiny room above the diner, a single cot that I sleep in and a wash basin. I've got no place to hide 12 people. But that night she got down on her knees and she prayed for a miracle. And in the morning she had one because the major came to her and he said, I'm taking a villa at the end of town. I'm going to be doing a lot of entertaining and you are going to come and be my housekeeper. I want you to go there today to see what it needs besides cleaning, which I know it will need. When mom went to the house, she saw a big, beautiful house on a corner lot. And when she walked up to the front door, she noticed something called a mezuzah. Anybody have an idea of what that is? A mezuzah, a little cylinder box, and it's in scripture where God says to bind God's word on your forehead and on the doorposts of your house. So there's scripture in it. It tells you that a Jewish family lived there, a wealthy Jewish family. And there was rumors going around that wealthy Jewish families in Europe, because of the persecution they had, often had a hiding place somewhere in their house. And she prayed that that was true. So she asked the major for a pass so she could go from the camp to the house over the next couple of days to get things ready. And over the next couple of days, she helped all 12 of her friends escape out of the laundry room. Okay, I got a time, time out, so we're going to stop. Are there any questions to ask if the story will continue? Yes. It's a big story. A, uh, high school kids don't ask questions. Junior high or middle school ask questions. I'm not sure about college, so let's see. Do you have questions? <laughs> yes. How was she able to? She was. She, it took her probably four months to be able to stand up and walk around. Yeah. But she, she did heal, and obviously she was able to have children. <coughs> only one. I'm the, her only child, but yeah. Yeah. Yes? Where are we at timeline-wise at this point? I would say we're about 1940, maybe even into 41 because Hitler invaded in 39. Yeah, good question, though. All right, take a break. You can come back. This is to be continued. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.